Hello there, my name is Nick and I am an engineer at Shopify. I'm here today to talk to you about Ruby Archaeology. Before I get started, I'd just like to say thank you so much to the organizers at Ruby Kaigi, the folks who sponsor it, and the people who put in so much effort every year to put on this wonderful conference. I've been a fan for many years of the wonderful, wonderful talks and, and content that comes out of this conference, and I'm just uh, honored to be a part of it. And I hope I can step up and give you at least a fraction of the quality that I've gotten to enjoy from you over the years. So I guess the first question that you're asking is, what is Ruby archaeology? It's obviously a term I've coined for this talk, but what does it really mean? Let me uh, step back a second and talk about my interest in Ruby history. Um, so I wasn't around at the beginning. You know, I wouldn't have been uh, reading Dave Thomas in 1998 or speaking Japanese before then, or um, you know, even hacking around pre pre you know 2003, four, five, six. Um, I love reading about it and I love looking at, through the history and I've run a newsletter for a while called past rubies where people get emails and you'd have on this day in history, various talks, uh, blog posts, releases, things around Ruby that you could see in a uh, little link list to your email inbox every week. And it's really fun to read and experience that history because I think it's important to revisit this content because Ruby is very much the same, uh, for the core uh, way that we use it over time. I've even written uh, adapters, so whenever I find a resource that was written back in the day, um, these objects can be passed uh, a date object, and then they'd give me a bunch of links uh, 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 that I could open and then read through the, the history. So I actually automate this with Ruby scripting. I've also written a gem in the past called Portal Gun. It's if you had, uh, say, a corrupted gem file dot lock or um, just uh, struggling with dependencies, you could pass into an executable your gem file and a date object again and get a gem file that points to a particular point in time. So if you knew in March 2011 your repository and gem file worked, you could pass in that date and it would give you all of your dependencies with the latest stable versions from that point in history. Um, also, you know, in the uh, especially around North America uh, in the uh, the pre 2010s, uh, why the lucky stiff was quite influential on me and and his work, and you know looking into into past rubies and historical Ruby code, and a lot of his content that he had on Ruby Talk and his own blogs and and explorations and gems that he'd written. One of the last tweets that he wrote before he disappeared in 2009 was. Programming is rather thankless. You see your works become replaced by superior works in a year, unable to run at all in a few more. So for this talk, I'm saying, let's run some old code. Let's do this. So the first thing that I'd like to do is talk about setting up a 2009 or 2008. You know, it's, we're going to jump between 08 and 09 in this talk. On a 2021 machine, I lost several days to this. It's actually quite a tricky ask and, and something that's not super easy to do. You can't just use RBN for RVM or something because funnily enough, you're not meant to. Ruby 1.8 and Ruby 1.9 were end of life seven years ago, over seven years ago. And if we're using Ruby 1.8, like, we're, spoiler, we're gonna use that today. It hasn't been the latest greatest for 14 years, so there's you know a lot of good reasoning to upgrade and keep your rubies going and not support older stuff but i believe that looking to our past is important we have a very mature language here with a feature rich robust ecosystem and i think to continue to progress forward with the language we must keep an eye on this old code pattern styles and debates because we'll just write ruby the way we've always known and not really uh think about alternative ways because we're you know, we can narrow down onto one track of writing a uh, language. It's actually a very sharp knife that you can use however you want. So let's get started. Here's how I got it done. The first thing I've decided is I can't actually run it directly on my machine, but I can get a vagrant box set up uh, that was appropriate to the time. We were very lucky that we're able to access older versions of Ubuntu is what we're using today. And if you've never used Vagrant before uh, and have no background, that's fine. You just brew install it 
And with these three commands, you are up and in a terminal in an operating system from a very long time ago. But you're only part of the way there at this point. You don't just get to code in Ruby. You have to worry about your dependencies. So the sources.list, which is a file in Ubuntu that says where to get dependencies, is pointing to a modern day repository, which is not going to have any of the dependencies that you're going to want for your 08 or 09 environment. Uh, thankfully, there is a way we can point to older packages because just like there's an old version of the operating system out there, some folks at old releases maintain the old dependencies. So using said here, I was able to uh, update my sources.list to point everything to old releases. And voila, whenever I run apt get, I will be getting the old uh, updates. Obviously, this isn't a perfect system because when you say old, you might be asking what old, what time in history? But this works for our purposes today. Also, debug like you're in the past. If you have a question, don't, don't think, oh, I'm in an old environment. And, and specify that just, you know, you probably don't do this often enough, but in, in Google, just type in the date and then go back in time and debug. So if you have a question about Ruby or something to do from 2008, 2009, then just plug your date in here and it's actually quite slick and you do feel like you're in the past. So with this setup, I actually just straight up installed Ruby directly and got 1.8.7 and it worked. And that was pretty cool. Um, Ruby gems did install, but it gem install wasn't working because it's just the protocol for connecting to Ruby gems today isn't perfect. And uh, Git also installed, but we had a few problems. Uh, Git doesn't want to talk to GitHub. Um, that probably doesn't surprise anyone here. So you can't Git pull, Git clone, any of that lovely stuff. So we're pretty hamstrung if we can't gem install or Git pull. But I had an idea here. We have the .gem files on downloads on rubygems.org. And I have a system that's strong enough that can do download files from the internet generally directly and install from the .gem file with the Ruby gems that I have. So if you look here and I use wget and I pull down an exact version of an old gem, and then I just do gem install local. And all of a sudden, here we are back in business. Uh, you're going to have a lot of other dependencies that you're probably going to want to install to use some basic gems, but that's just because you've got a very blank box here. So, okay, you are set up. You are ready to code some old Ruby. So let's look into some old Ruby code together with our new system. Nokogiri. You are possibly quite familiar with this. This is the industry standard for HTML parsing. Uh, it, a tremendous amount of gems rely on it. It's got, I believe, hundreds of millions of downloads. Mechanized other gems require it. Um, popular web frameworks also do too. And I think that this is a great one to start with because you know it. It's around today. It's strong. It's robust. But it was also releasing in 2008 for the first time, which is perfect for us. So we can actually go to the version of Nokogiri, something we're familiar with, familiar with the API play around with it and expect it to behave well on our old machine. And then, you know, we can actually look at the code from the time. So without further ado, let's get into the demo. All right, here we are in our coding environment, coding Ruby 1.8.7 as if we are in 2008 with appropriate versions of our gems installed locally. So here in our terminal, the first thing that we're gonna do is require Nokogiri and Whoops, that's right. Uh, in 2008, you had to require Ruby gems before you could require Nokogiri. Now let me go into an IRB where I've already set up into my IRBRC the require for Ruby gems. So that just comes with us right out of the gate. A lot of people would have done that then. And if you use open URI, um, here's a little curiosity for you. You're probably quite familiar to opening websites. And we'll just open a little bit of Markdown here. Uh, straight from Google, but whoops again. Uh, open was not called on URI back then. Uh, open was a kernel level method. So we'll just remember that uh, whenever you're working on this and it's kind of nice to just call, you know, open straight out of the gate. So you just go Nokogiri, pass it an HTML file that I've written for you 
And I've got a little greeting here for you as well. And you can kind of interact with it as you want, as you see here with the P tags. Um, you can do you know, a search method or call straight CSS on it as well. So pretty much behaves as you'd expect today. And there we go, we've, we've done code in 2008. Now let's have a little more fun and look at some Nokogiri core code from that point in history. All right, let's have a first look at our actual library code. If you're a seasoned Rubyist and have been coding for a while, uh, nothing about this probably looks interesting to you or, or odd. But if you have been hacking on Ruby for seven or less years, something may seem a little different in the dialect. That's right, uh, you may have had years of being forced to make your multiple line blocks be do or end, but as you see here, we have curly braces. That is actually a big part of Ruby lore and discussion and uh, convention in the past. So Avdi Grimm uh, talks about it uh, using the curly brackets for the functional blocks where, where you want something to be returned here and then do end is where you have a side effect actually coming from it. And Avdi talked about this a decade ago now, over a decade ago, but he is actually able to do some research and point to, and, and some may already be saying this to their screens, this was uh, first documented and discussed, uh, to our knowledge, by Jim Wyrick uh, seven years earlier, so a good 17 and a half years ago, uh, talking about how you use blocks in this manner. And uh, that's why uh, Avdi and, and others, and I'd say myself included, would call that the uh, Wyrick convention. I'd encourage you to consider using this in your Ruby as well. I think it's a beautiful dialect and something that you see a lot from that period in time. Now we have another little interesting snippet here. There's a few things going on, but it may not be completely evident to you, but um, actually invoking a method with colon colon. Uh, that is still fully supported in Ruby. That's something that, you know, again, your linters may cry out at you, but that is completely valid Ruby. And then sometimes when you're writing your code and, and you want to express a certain something, I don't know what you'd say in, in this case, uh, but the, the colon colon instead of the full stop is a really interesting way, I think, to uh, invoke your method. And another, just a little one here before we move on, you know, adder accessor doesn't have to be all in line. You can call it wherever you want as many times as you want. And I think that's kind of a fun way to do it. Now let's move on to another gem that I'd like to take a peek at. You may not know this one unless you were definitely hacking Ruby 13 years ago, but it's called Hpricot. And it is a fantastic one to link on on the back of this because it kind of ended when Nokogiri uh, kicked off, but they have a really deep connection. Uh, from the maintainer Tenderlove here, you have uh, you know Nokogiri being a drop-in replacement for Hpricot. Um, the Nokogiri was faster, had less bugs, but it gave you the same power that you had from Hpricot, which was then the, the kind of industry standard for the HTML parsing and, and doing all of that fun stuff. Uh, it just stopped being maintained by its original maintainer, uh, who was Why the Lucky Stiff in 2009. So it gives us a really good snapshot to look at a proper real bit of code that just doesn't exist or is maintained anymore and use it ourselves. So let's jump into a little demo here as well. Okay, so we're getting hpercot required and gonna go straight to business parsing an HTML file that I've written. I love this part of the API that you just call top level hpercot and you pass in your HTML directly to it. So we're gonna read that out. It's not as pretty for the output, but we do have it and we've got our doc assigned. So we're gonna set up an empty array to start. And I just wanna have a look here. So with our instance variable that we've assigned the output, we can do a forward slash uh, table TR to parse it, which I think is a really elegant part of the API. We're gonna iterate through our output and I'm gonna take uh, each row's inner text um, for the cells. And if it's premium lamb, these are types of meat, I want to know where they're from. Of course, we have a little area you get to see there. But there's uh, Japan and France and Australia and some various prices. And there we go. So with that, let's hop back into Hpricot Core. 
All right, now let's look into our hpercot code here. And this is, this is quite fun from the very beginning because if you have a look, we see that we have uh, this def hpercot method, right? You, you never see methods with a cap capital at the beginning, um, but then it aligns with hpercot module itself, but it gives you that ability to do what I like there, which is just calling hpercot immediately after the require and passing arguments immediately into it. As you can see, it accepts a block and the block is the beautiful part that lets you set your options for running hpercot. Uh, the second thing here is self is hpercot. Uh, this is an idiom uh, or even just really just a dialect that you don't see as much anymore. But def hpercot.make is the same as def self.make. Uh, and that's something I'd like to see a bit more of in Ruby. Um, I know we have conventions for good reason and we want code to be readable by everyone. But I think if you're writing your own code, you get to have fun and have, uh, you know, it's kind of like you're still speaking English, but maybe you're in Australia or maybe you're in Canada and there's these different things, uh, which is which is quite fun to see. Also, we have the blank slate class, which was made famous around the time. Um, it, it provides an abstract base class with no predefined methods except for underscore underscore send and underscore underscore ID and obviously instance eval. Um, if you have classes that depend on method missing, say a dynamic, uh, you know, base uh, class, then you are able to use this to do some pretty cool stuff, as you see, like with hpercot. Um, and this is a pretty handy one to use. Um, so then we're going into the config here. There's, there's a little bit going on, but let me highlight this uh, for you again. Um, we're, you know, self is self. So this is kind of like a two for one special. Uh, so earlier I said that colon colon is the same as a dot or a full stop. And Ruby and self is the is the name of the thing, right? And you see a recursive invocation of it in there, and you and you see def config colon colon expand, and I love it. Um, you know, it's it's funny how we have it referenced in this way. Uh, you know, there's the the whole Ruby thing where we have the uh, I think from Lisp the the hashtag reference as well. But uh, people were talking about this and how to use a self and, you know, class self is another way, but this is Ruby talk in 2006. Uh, it's been a long debated thing, but there's a lot of fun ways to use it. Also, uh, you probably a bit more, this is just a quick one, uh, familiar with alias as opposed to alias method. So that's fun. Now, let's go again uh, to a very popular gem from the time that's related in kind of the similar world. This is more creation than reduction, but this is builder. And without really further ado, I just want to go in there and start hacking on some builder as if we're in 2008. Jim Wyrick was the maintainer of builder, which is used to build XML markup in a beautiful Ruby-ish way. As you can see, uh, initializing it here, uh, we're using our hash rockets, which were the way of the times. They're still supported, but they were the only way to go then. And just let's look at this markup, right? So you just pass in a block, you call it dot person out of having not said what a person is. Same with dot name and dot phone. You can sense some method missing being used and voila, you have a valid uh, XML coming out, which is uh, pretty neat. And it just almost instantaneously works as you'd expect, like Matt's is principle of least surprise, but with this library. You, you know what this is going to output, even if you've never seen Builder before, right? And I think that is beautiful. Now let's go a little bigger, even a little deeper. And let's see if you can see what I'm trying to do here before I tell you what I'm trying to do. Yep, it supports uh, passing Builder to itself or even as an argument, as you see on the third line. So it really does do whatever you want it to do. So having looked at that, now let's step back one last time and have a look at the internals uh, behind Builder. Hey, there's our friend Blank Slate again. Yep, hpercot, I believe, took inspiration from Blank Slate, which Jim Wyrick, who wrote Builder, uh, talked about at conferences around the time and implemented himself. In it. And you can see it dotted around Ruby at the time and still even around uh, a little bit today. Um, you also see the use of the AND keyword, which is 
become kind of a no-no these days. And I think it shouldn't be. I think if you think of um, and in the correct way, that it could be a really fun part of your code. Same with or. Uh, again, I'm going to quote Avdi Grimm here, and I'm going to directly read this out. So I think their reputation for being confusing stems from thinking of them as Boolean logic operators at all. If you think about them that way, then you have to keep remembering how they differ from the you know double ampers hand and pipes. Whereas if you think of them as a control flow only in the same vein as if and unless, they have a lot more um, self-explanatory, self-evident. So you can think of it about the reverse of if. So instead of an inline next if foo equals one, you could do foo equals one and next. So that's a little thing that you can spice up your Ruby code with. And I love, you know, the readability of it. And for our last little bit of uh, demo, this is going to be the last library code I look at. You get to see once again, uh, the curly brackets uh, returning a value with the Wyrick principle in Wyrick's original code there in the rake file. So that's it. That is all of our digging for today in the code. I've really enjoyed it. I hope you have as well. I'd like to talk about, you know, a few projects that would be fun to dig into. There is a really fun, small uh, micro framework uh, for the web called Camping at the time. I think it'd be interesting if we could get it, uh, this old code running on some hosted boxes to actually serve up a few websites off of Camping. There's also Unholy, um, which converts Ruby to Python bytecode and recompiles back to Python. You know, it was quite common early 2000s for people who loved Ruby so much. There was a time when you couldn't really get paid to do Ruby. A lot of people won't believe that, uh, where you would actually use your Ruby to convert it into the language you were getting paid to write. And I think Unholy would be another fun one to dig into. Uh, for future considerations around this, because I am going to keep digging, that is what I do. Um, I'd like to have my box maybe have an executable like schwad install that wraps around the steps needed for gem install locally. So you could just pass the gem name. It'd find a gem for 2008. It would pull it down. It'd do the local install. Um, and I, I, I'd also like to you know, link into some of that into the cloud again so people can maybe hack uh, without having this whole setup. I think uh, you should become a Ruby archaeologist if you love Ruby, if you love the talks. You know, there are, I've been talking about years and years of talks, but there's years and years and millions of lines of free code sitting out there waiting for you to play with it. You can, I've shown today, you can run it, you can work in it, you can get it up and running and uh, have uh, revelations and explorations and explore new dialects and new ways of writing code. If you're just writing in the same organization all the time, you'll develop one flow and, and you'll maybe miss out on some of the beauty that you get from the language. And I believe this so strongly that I'm giving you a gift today. My gift to you is a box. If you uh, go vagrant in it, schwad slash ruby underscore archaeologist, and then vagrant up, you will have this exact same environment that I built by hand today. That's right. With those two commands, you could vagrant SSH into a box and start running all your Ruby code. The three gems that I've demoed today are in that box, so you can do the exact demos that I've done and have a heck of a lot of fun. This will be free and out forever, and I may even update it with fun new features as time goes. I have another bonus. Remember this? Yeah, that is also 2008 Ruby code uh, for 1.8.7. That was music that was written. But why didn't I feature it in the talk? Because not all code dies a death and is unrunnable in a few years. This is the same exact gem that had its last release in 2008, or possibly even earlier, if I don't recall correctly. But it runs on Ruby 3.0, and that was running on 3.0 today. So go and write your own theme song as well on Bloopsophone. Thank you very much for your time. Uh, here's some information about the stuff I work on, and if you'd like to contact me and get in touch, I'd love to hear your experiences with historical Ruby, things that I missed, things that you find interesting, and. Once again, just thank you so much and enjoy the conference.